Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask an Expert. We have Dr. Erica Latcher with us today, and you probably recognize her voice. I know we have a lot of super fans of her podcast with Justin Long, Straight from the Horse Doctor's Mouth. And I mean, I'm hooked on it, which I was actually nervous to start listening to it because I was like, I'm nervous. I won't understand a lot of like information coming from a veterinarian and you guys just make it so digestible and understandable for somebody who's not a veterinarian. I was telling you before, Erica, that it's, I mean, it's such an impressive production, both from a content and production standpoint. So (laughs) I am feeling very grateful and honestly kind of nervous to interview you because you're so good at it. So um, thank you for being here with us. Kinsey and I are really excited to talk to you tonight. I'm super excited to be here and I will tell Justin that the production is good because that is all him. Uh, Lots of the questions are him too. And he definitely tells me, nope, too many big words, bring it on down. (laughs) It's so good. Well, that's, that's like the dream partnership, the checks and balances. Everyone has their strengths and their roles. Um, So let's start, we'll get to know you. We'll talk a little bit about about the podcast. And then our topic for today is colic and other health hazards. But for anybody listening live, we can certainly deviate from that. So if you have other questions for Dr. Latcher about um, horse health or even about podcasts or her career as a vet, um, feel free to put those in chat or just say hello in chat. We would love to hear from you and hear who's tuning in. To start, Dr. Latcher, where are you located and will you tell us about your practice and kind of what your day-to-day life looks like? We are located in Newberry, Florida, which is a teeny tiny town about an hour west, sorry, about 10 minutes west of Gainesville, about an hour north of Ocala. So I always say that I am Ocala insanity adjacent. I can go visit it when I want, but I don't have to live in it. (laughs) Um, Our practice is a wide variety of horses. Uh, We have Olympic athletes to backyard to a lot of me. I sort of say I'm the average client. I have a day job for sure. Uh, I really want to go ride my horse and I really want to go enjoy my horse. And I have the relationship with my horse as the most important component of what I do with her Uh, and the rest of them too, even my chestnut mare. Uh, you know, so that is a really important component of what I do. And it's a very important component of most of my clients and their interaction with their horses. So our job as veterinarians, the way we see it is to make the world a better place for horses and to help their owners do that. As you were describing that I was, it was sounding so familiar because that's what we hear from a lot of ride IQ members. And that's something I didn't mention in the intro, which is that you are a ride IQ member. Another thing when I found that out that I was like, wow, this is really exciting. Um, so I use it all the time. I love ride IQ. So I'm just going to go on about how great you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's amazing. We are very flattered to know that. Um, tell us a little bit about your riding background though. When did you start riding? Do you do you commit to a specific discipline or are you hybrid rider? Tell us more about that. I started riding when I was about five years old. Um, my mom became a CPA at that time. She passed her accounting exam. And as a present to herself, we got a horse. She was a backyard horse that I bombed around on for a really long time. I got more serious about horses in my teenage years and actually did much more of the stock horse stuff. I showed Appaloosas and did, you know, Western pleasure, that kind of thing. Uh, I had an Appaloosa who happened to do the hunters really, really well. And so I got into the hunters. And then from there, that's sort of where I've been is I've been in the hunter jumper world. Um, I did determine that I'm much more of a jumper. So uh, I I show in the jumpers now and have for probably the last 10 years or so. Um, I have a retired off the track thoroughbred who's amazing. He has every physical problem in the world, though. Uh, And then I have a chestnut mare who I constantly argue with whether or not we really want to do this today. And then I have the most perfect warm blood. uh, She's a warm blood appendix quarter horse cross, which I highly recommend. She has a fabulous forelock and she loves to do whatever I want to do. And she lets me do things like dress her up for Halloween, show in the meter tens on the weekend and, you know, play around with Liberty and groundwork during the week. So she's, she's just perfect and wonderful. That's amazing. Throw a little quarter horse in just about anything and you get something pretty special. Also, you're off the track thoroughbred, got the right owner at least with his 
physical issues. <laughs> but you have your hands full. Being a vet and having three horses, it's really that you're like working with all of them. It's it's amazing to me how committed people are to make it work because it doesn't come easy. <laughs> As I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so let's jump into some of the questions that we got on the topic today. I oftentimes I'll get a Slack message from Kinsey and she'll be like, could you stop chatting so we could actually get to members <laughs> questions? So I'll try to be better about that today. Since the topic is colic, can we start at the highest level? And will you just start by telling us what is colic? Colic is a bit of a generic term. And that's where we often as horse owners get in trouble. It is the term that we use to describe a horse basically showing us any indication of abdominal pain. And for horses, that's typically laying down, stretching out, rolling, you know, the things that we think of when it comes to mind that colic is happening. The problem is that we can have those same symptoms in a horse who is experiencing a choke. We can have it in horses who are experiencing muscle pain. And what those symptoms you see when they're, they're laying down, they're doing the stretching out, that is actually just a manifestation of pain. So the trick sometimes as a veterinarian when I arrive is to figure out, is this truly a GI colic or are we looking at something else? Most of the time, because horses are horses and they have the world's most ridiculously designed GI tract, it's a GI problem, right? But there are times that you're going to see those symptoms that they have nothing to do with the GI tract. The reason that we typically see GI problems with horses is because they're what we call hindgut fermenters. And that means that they make a lot of gas. Mm -hmm. And especially at least in fall where it's a feels like of 115 at five o'clock at night, they will make a lot of gas in all of that hot weather. If they decide to not drink enough, they will get an impaction and that gas builds up and it's got nowhere to go. So colic for us is a wide array of, of things that can happen. And the symptoms aren't always as straightforward as you think they are. That was a complicated answer for it depends. No, super helpful. Um, Kinsey, I saw you were about to jump in. I have one more and then I'll hand the mic over. So when you start, seeing I'm going to move a cat real quick. Hold on. Great. <laughs> when you start seeing these symptoms or anything similar to them, if it's colic, how long after the horse consumes food would you expect to see it? Or is it not related to their eating schedule? It, it depends. That's the answer a lot with colic. But for me, the most common thing we see this time of year, like I said, is that gas colic. And that is my horse eats. They do all of their normal things. And about 10 to 15 later minutes later, they are on the ground like they look like they're going to die. They're thrashing. They're painful. They're doing all of these horrible moves. And if you give that 10 minutes, off they go. So those horses that show those symptoms right after they eat and they're pretty severe, that leads me more to a gas colic. And that's just a gas bubble that needs to move. You know, as horse owners, we've all eaten Taco Bell so that our horses could eat the best that's out there. So we know what a gas bubble feels like and it can be painful. So looking at that timing with food, is pretty critical for me. Most of the other colics will happen nowhere near food time. You know, if we've got an impaction that's built up or if we've got something going on with the small intestine, we'll often see those happening not around feed time. So they're not really associated with directly eating. Kins, we can't hear you yet. Um, <laughs> no, we still can't hear you. <laughs> Um, she'll switch her mic, which is works well for me. So it sounds like it's actually as an owner, potentially less concerning if it happens right after food time, um, versus if you come to the barn midday and you're seeing symptoms like this, I remember having hesitations as an owner to call the vet and your, yours and Justin's podcast has really taught me that there's kind of no shame in calling the vet when you need to, or when you're unsure, especially when it could be a very serious situation. And colic is obviously a situation that oftentimes could be life, life threatening. So will you walk us through kind of the checklist that people can take what they're seeing compared to when they should call you? And with, with in mind that a lot of people live in the middle of Montana or, 
not near a vet. So kind of like what this, how this all plays out. Absolutely. So one of the first things that you should know how to do with your horse, especially if you are in an area that is uh, vet scarce, which is getting more and more common. That's a whole other podcast. But um, so if you can take your horse's vital signs reliably, that is going to be super helpful. Uh, we do have a video on it. There's millions of videos out there on YouTube on how to do it. But being able to get a heart rate, a respiratory rate, and an idea on gut sounds along with a temperature is going to tell you tons of information. So for example, that horse who's on the ground 10 minutes after dinner, they look really violent. When you get them up, their heart rate is typically in a normal range, which for horses is 28 to 48. So I'll get those, you know, I'll get there and I'll see those horses being violent. I put my stethoscope on and I've got a heart rate of 36 and I'm like, oh, we're all right. We're going to, we're going to get through this together. And so that's a, a very useful piece of information to start with. If you've got a normal heart rate, it's a big, big deal. And you can say, all right, let me give this 10 or 15 minutes and see what's going to happen. The horse who's laying down and laying quietly, I'm going to say, you can go ahead and watch that horse. Uh, you know, the one who's up and down, that sort of thing, that's okay too. It's the ones who are throwing themselves down violently and are often in a full body lather. Those are the ones where if you can get a heart rate, you'll find most of those heart rates are over 60 and that's a big deal. And it's time to figure out with a veterinarian, what you can get done. So if you've got a veterinarian that's far away, do I have drugs available to me that I can do with guidance from a veterinarian? So I know that I'm giving the right things versus if that heart rate is lower than 60, you can take a minute, go get a drink of water, take a, let your horse kind of chill out, see what's going on, give it 10 or 15 minutes and see what you got. Okay. Kinsey's still working on her audio. Is there anything that a horse owner could have done to prevent the colic from happening? Or is it a total fluke? Most of the time, I will tell you that we can prevent them. There are, and by most, I would say it's horses, right? It's probably 70, 30. Um, there are some that they're just because it's got a really stupid design. I, I always say that it was designed by committee. No one consulted me. Like it's just, it's horrible how this whole thing was put together. So my keys are starting with a good diet that is based on roughage and horses should get somewhere between, sorry, 1.8 and 2.2 pounds per hundred pounds of body weight of roughage. So for a thousand pound horse, that's 20 pounds of hay a day. And if you don't have any idea how much hay you're feeding, you should weigh it. It's pretty easy to do. You just go get a luggage scale, figure out an approximate. You know, I don't weigh my hay every day, but I weigh it periodically, especially if I get a new shipment where the bales look different and make sure I'm still being consistent with what I'm doing. So your diet should be based on roughage and not concentrate. We know the more concentrates horses get, the more susceptible they are to colic. If at all possible, your horse having regular access to turnout, or if that's difficult in the area where you live, having an opportunity where they get exercised maybe once a day, they get walked a couple of times a day. Basically, they get out of that stall and move like horses were designed to move. And then hydration, which is, as we all know, the hardest one because you can lead a horse to water, but you dang sure cannot make them drink. So I work on strategies for those horses who aren't great drinkers like adding electrolytes to their food, adding water to their food, because you can often lead a horse to soup and make them eat soup as opposed to drink water. And then I really monitor my horses and see, are you drinking appropriate amounts of water? You know, mine are out for 12 hours a day, so it's a little harder, but I know how much water they typically drink in a stall. If they aren't drinking enough, then I may start looking at other strategies like soaking their hay, giving them some hay cube soaked or beet pulp. Beet pulp soaks up a ton of water. So you're getting a lot of water into them that way, but looking at sort of backdoor ways to get hydration into them. So those are, those are keys there. My next prevention key is making sure that your horse is on some sort of routine. And I always say that you have to be consistently consistent or consistently inconsistent, but your horse cares which one of those things happen. 
So if you're feeding on a regular schedule, you know, if you're a seven and four kind of barn, then you need to feed at seven and four. If you are, your work schedule is such that you need to feed at all different times of the day, then you need to be consistent with that all different times of the day. Horses seem to handle whatever the routine is. They just need to know what it is. And if it's chaos, that's okay too. You just need to be consistent with that. So those are my biggies for preventing colic. Hydration, hydration, hydration being the biggest. Super helpful. And we have a question that came in that's along these lines that I want to get to next. But how, if if you board your horse, so you're not the one filling up the water buckets and whatnot, how can you check their hydration status? Or There's a few different ways. Uh, the, the most common is what we call a skin pinch and what you want to watch. And this is what I see is lots of us walk up to the middle of the neck and we grab a pinch of skin and we say, okay, how's it doing there? And that skin is a little loose. So we actually have two better options for where to do that. One is on the point of the shoulder where the skin comes across really tight. You just grab a pinch there. The other place, this is a little harder depending on the horse, but the eyelid is a great one. You can grab a little pinch and see if it pops back down. If you check your horse on a regular basis, you will know what's normal for them. And so that'll give you a great idea of, is this a normal kind of skin pop down for them? Or is that a little slow? I will also lift up the lip and check the gums and see they should be really moist. Um, you know, you should see glistening kind of moisture on the, the gums and the gums of your horse should be a pale pink. Usually people will call us with a colic and say they're really pale. That's actually normal. We worry lay, way less about really pale than we do about really dark red. So getting an idea of what's normal for your horse is a great way to tell hydration. And then another way is looking at the manure, uh, especially if there's a, a fresh pile that they've passed. You can imagine most of my life involves manure in some way, shape or form. But I take a look at that pile of manure and I say, you know, like, where is it? For example, this time of year on my horses who are out on really great pasture, sometimes a little too great, uh, you know, if I pick up that manure, it's like there's literally moisture coming out of it because they've got that much excess versus I will go to some of these colics who have been in particular in the fall here, all of a sudden thrown large quantities of hay and you'll pick up those balls of manure and they're just, you know, they crumble like dust in your hand. So knowing the normal for your horse on what their manure is like will also be a great way for you to tell if they're appropriately hydrated without necessarily having an eye on their water buckets 24 seven. Wow. You taught me multi, I, I knew the skin pinching. I definitely would have gone mid neck. I didn't know about gums or manure. What would cause the dark red gums? If you see dark red gums, that's really, really bad. And you should call your veterinarian immediately. That is an indication of toxicity. And those are very, very sick horses. You okay. will have very little doubt that your horse is sick. Um, it will either, your horse will either be throwing themselves on the ground or more commonly, those are the horses who stand there. They just stand there and look blah, you know, they look like a dead horse standing basically. Yeah. Um, so you, you rarely have any doubt your horse is sick when they have red gums, but if you lift up a gum and it's red call immediately. It sounds like the people who are nervous that their horse's gums are pale, they're kind of looking for maybe the first time or they haven't looked for a while. And you know, you guide them to do that. And they're like, Whoa, <laughs> these are <laughs> not what I would expect. But it seems like one of those things that like checking now and then what's the normal would make sense. Kinsey, welcome back to the video. For anyone listening, Kinsey's been in and out a bit. Do you want to check your audio? Can you hear me now? Oh, we yes. can hear you. <laughs> I only had to I was, restart my whole computer. <laughs> well, it's you sound, you have the voice of an angel now. Um, I'm going to quickly read Debbie's question because it's really along the lines of what Dr. Latcher was just talking about. Debbie, thank you for this question. She said, with so much information and knowledge on how to best feed horses, why do you think people and owners and boarding barns are often still feeding abundant amounts of grain and not providing forage at all times? Financially, it doesn't make sense as grain is far more expensive than hay. And we know how important forage is to digestion, especially in preventing ulcers and stall vices, and just in general, allowing horses to feel relaxed and not worrying about their next meal. Oh, that's a great question. I wish I had an answer for it. Um, my biggest answer is that we preach that all diets should be based on roughage first, and then you use concentrate to fill in the blanks. Um, I will also say as an answer to this sort of is that on the back of pretty much every brand of feed, there is a 1-800 number to reach the, the manufacturer 
for the biggies, uh, Purina, Neutrina, Buckeye, Triple Crown. I'm sure I'm missing a few there, but if you call that number, you will be connected directly to an equine nutritionist who can help you formulate the appropriate diet for your horse. And I have certainly found that sometimes my voice is not appropriate enough. So I find someone who is a PhD in equine nutrition to help me out. <laughs> it's a team. I'll go now. <laughs> Sorry. I kind of, I just got out of the rotation. Um, that's really helpful. And that's something that like, we've had several equine nutritionists on here before. And that's something that we hear over and over again, is just like forage first. Um, so hopefully that just becomes more of the norm, especially at these boarding barns. So I apologize if Jessa asked this while I was off. So just tell me if it's a repeat a repeat question. Uh, when you do get any of these symptoms, even if it's even if it does seem like a gas situation that's going to pass in 10 to 15 minutes, what is the correct protocol? Like, what should I do? I obviously call your vet and ask, but what should you be, what should I do with my horse to make them more comfortable? The hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Nothing. <laughs> that is so difficult, but for the most part on these horses, what we recommend is if they're laying and laying quietly, let them be. The last thing you should do on a horse who is not violently painful, we're talking about sort of your run of the mill average colic that you see, please, please, please do not walk them. What do you have? What do you do when your stomach is upset? Like you lay in bed, you lay on the couch, you feel sorry for yourself. You watch really bad TV. That's what these guys want to do too. So as long as they are not being extremely violent and trying to hurt themselves, I let them do whatever it is they're doing. Most horses will work it out, um, especially like the gas, some of that kind of stuff, if you give them a moment to, to be quiet and laying. The problem with the old wives tale of walking a colic, which I'm not entirely sure how we have done so well as a veterinary community getting that firmly ingrained, um, but I wish that I could get inside leg to outside rein as firmly in my head as walk a colic is. Anyway, um, the problem with that is very often we see a horse who is exhausted because it's been walked for eight hours mm -hmm. and you know, that, that was this weekend. So letting them lay and lay quiet, if they want to lay on their side and sit up, you know, if they want to stand up, lay down, all of those things are fine. When I grew up in horses, I was told that you never let them roll because they'll twist their gut. And it's actually the other way around. When you see a horse who is intensely painful, throwing themselves on the ground violently. Those are the horses and they have a heart rate over 60. I promise you. Those are the horses who have twisted their gut and are now rolling because they're intensely painful. Those I will attempt to keep up and walking or at least get them into a place where they can be violent without hurting themselves more. You know, I'll try to get them into the middle of a pasture or something like that where they can safely be violent. And those are the horses that honestly, I am breaking land speed records to get to you when you call me with those. So, you know, your veterinarian is going to know from just the description on the phone that that's one that we're going to rush to. But if they are being a mild colic, let them be, let them be quiet. We don't necessarily mind if our clients give banamine, but we ask that they talk to us first. So, you know, plenty of them have banamine and we're absolutely okay with it. We just want a phone call first so that we can talk through, is that an appropriate scenario to have banamine? And for some of these horses, if you've gotten vital signs, you'll find that they're not actually a colic, but that they have a fever. And we're going to use banamine in a very different way in those horses. So, you know, that's sort of our protocol is if they're being anything but horrifically violent, let them be and let them do what they want to do. Wow. It is unfortunate that these myths have gotten like spread like they have. Um, but those are definitely myths that I'm very familiar with. Helpful to know like how to cope with, especially the rolling, that it's not really the rolling that is the issue. It's potentially like how the horse is being violent and could hurt themselves in other ways. We've talked about taking the horse's vital signs, potentially giving the horse banamine, is there anything else that would be helpful to have on hand for someone? Um, let's say it's, I mean, maybe we could talk about both scenarios. The vet is nowhere near them or the vet is like, you know, 40 minutes away. Right. So more and more commonly for vet clients that I have a great relationship with, and even if they're far away from me, in fact, if they're far away from me, they're probably more likely to have some of the drugs that the ones close to us don't necessarily need. 
But the key is they have a great relationship with me. And I know we're going to talk about it before they give it. But there's a drug called Buscapan, which is a smooth muscle relaxer. And I like to say it's like hitting control, alt, delete on your computer, kind of like Kinsey just to do. It shuts things down and it brings them back online. And for many horses doing that, will get the gut to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was having a little moment there, but I'm okay now. Uh, and so it's a really great jug. It's also pretty safe. You can give it in the muscle or in the vein, and you don't have to worry about the horrible things like uh, banamine in the muscle can cause some really bad things. So we, we definitely recommend against that. But buscapan is a great drug. Again, those clients who are far away from me may also have sedatives. Um, closer clients typically rely on us a little bit more, but the, the farther away ones will have a protocol in place for, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we strongly recommend they call us ahead of time. Like I said, just so that we can make a plan and discuss what's going on and then move the right direction with the drugs they have available to them. That's, that's really helpful. And where, when it comes to the walking, like the walking myth that we've all heard. Like I remember that so firmly growing up. Like if any time we thought a horse was remotely like any giving any colic sim symptoms, it was like, everybody, we're gonna walk around. We're not gonna let them lay down. Like, where does that come from? Like what, why do maybe if we can understand why people thought that was right, we can understand like where the thought process is is misconstrued. Is it just is it because of the injuring themselves while getting up and down? Like, or why do people think that? I think it comes from horses twisting their gut. Um, and so we, you know, for a long time, we as horse people and even the veterinary community felt that this was a result of rolling, because if you think about it, oh, they've got an impaction, they've got gas. Those two things are, you know, weight in different places. And when they roll, it twists around. It's actually, they twist because of the very stupid design that we talked about. So on the right side of your horse, the large colon is attached in one place. Then it comes around, goes all the way around the front underneath your girth, comes around, does a really, really, really stupid U-turn where it gets narrower. That's a common problem spot. And then it goes back around to where it was. And then it goes out to what we call the small colon, which is where they actually make the fecal balls. Most of our problems are in that large colon and it's twists and turns. And because it's only attached in one place, it can you know, while you're, you're experiencing kind of that cramp that we've all been there, like I said, with, with uh, a gas bubble, it can literally cramp itself into a twist and that's how they twist their colon. And I think that, you know, we go back a hundred years, none of us had the ability to know that that was how that happened. And so the only thing we knew was that these horses would pass away, we'd open them up and they would have a twisted colon. So it made sense that it was because they rolled. Um, but unfortunately that's not, not the case at all. And so letting them lay and lay quietly helps us have a horse who's a better patient in case we need to go forward with things like colic surgery, for example. Got it. Let's talk about timeline. So what is, is there a typical timeline or I guess what's the range of a timeline between first symptoms and this is a very scary situation? For us, our guideline is about 30 to 45 minutes. If you have a horse who's showing you symptoms of colic and they are not improved in 30 to 45 minutes, uh, then we're going to say we're definitely going to need to do something about that. I don't necessarily mind if, like I said, you call me in that first five minutes and you give banamine, but no matter how you give banamine, whether it's in the mouth or in the vein, uh, you're going to need to wait a good 45 minutes for an effect. Lots of people think that you give it and it works instantaneously, but this drug does not work that way. So if you've got it on board, we're going to wait a full 45 minutes before we say if we've had an effect. And for us, it's, is that horse interested in eating? And so I may offer them a tiny amount. So I'll give them, you know, like a treat or a piece of carrot or something small and say, okay, we're 45 minutes out. How are you doing? If that horse is not interested in food at that time, then that is definitely a call to me to head that way. Or, you know, it's a call for backup to say, I've done the things, things are not going the way I want them you know, even if we're being mild, but we're not interested in food, we need to address it. Um, if the horse is being violent and it's violent for longer than 10 minutes, definitely going to head your way. Those, like I said, those gas colics that are, they will look the same as a large colon torsion, but they do it right after they eat. And they do it for a very small amount of time. They only do it for about 10 minutes or so. And then there's a loud toot and off they go. <laughs> and a huge sigh of relief from the owner. <laughs> like the... <laughs> 
There's a lot of noises happening. <laughs> exactly. From there, if we come out and let's say that we have, I'm going to go with sort of our typical colic scenarios, which uh, especially in this weather again, because it's so hot out, would be an impaction where we reach in and palpate and we say, oh, I feel an impaction. Most of the time we're going to feel that impaction at that really stupid spot where the colon does a 180 degree turn and also gets narrower because any plumber would tell you that's a bad idea. So that's what horses do. So if we feel an impaction there, we're going to work on hydration. And for us, that means no mineral oil. So we give a large bucket of water via that NG tube. Uh, and we put a combination of salts in there. So we basically make them Gatorade without the sugar. We put that in and that helps us dissolve that impaction. The thing is that it's going to take a little bit for all of that to happen. So as long as they're being only mildly uncomfortable, and I always say that you wouldn't use the word flail or violent to describe what they're doing. We're going to let them do what they're doing. If you can check their heart rate and tell me that it's below about 48, then we're going to let them keep doing what they're doing. And we're going to let them do that for about three to four hours. Uh, and then we're going to see where we are. If the symptoms come back, then it's almost always an indication that we need hospitalization for advanced things. Most of the time for an impaction, that's just a matter of fluids. And we just need to run some IV fluids. For those horses that are being violent and they're doing it longer than 10 minutes, or you put your stethoscope on and you see that they have a heart rate over 60, if at all possible, our protocol for those is you load them in the trailer and you either head to us or you head to a surgery table. And the farther you are away from a veterinarian, the more likely I am to say, head on to the surgery table if surgery is an option. And the reason is we have very limited time on those horses. The colon can be in very dire straits in as little as two hours. So that's sort of our, our guideline on those. That's fascinating about the trailer. So in that case, I would guess the horse is in pretty bad discomfort. Would you expect that they're able to stand in the trailer for that ride? Are they generally able to manage that? Okay. Most of them do pretty well, but I always say I don't tie them. Um, and I put them in as big an area on the trailer as I can. And if they go down and you feel them go down, keep driving. We will deal with it when they get to the surgery center. We have the ability to deal with down horses. Do not stop. Do not collect $200. Just keep going. <laughs> just get them to where they to need to be. Hear about it's so just like traumatic. And I know you have definitely established like the you know, the calm genes you need in emergencies, but it <laughs> having not been through it, that sounds incredibly traumatic, even if the outcome is great and what you hope for. And, you know, our goal is at the end of it, that you're standing at the surgical facility and your horse is like, just kidding. I was fine. But you know, for all of us who that's an option, then we want to get them to where they need to be as soon as we can. And like I said, we can, we can handle it at the surgical facilities. If they're down in the trailer, the best thing to do is just get them there as fast as you can. With the timeline on colic being so short, like it's, you're saying 45 minutes, I'm surprised this isn't happening like a lot like in the middle of the night where you're not even able to help and you're getting there in the morning to like feed your horse. And there's, I mean, like it's gone very awry. Um, is there any reason that that's not like something that we hear about happening a lot? Or am I just not hearing about that happening a lot? Um, or is there like something associated with this happening during the daytime? I don't know. What it's because you're about? not on call at night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Helpful. Okay. Good to know. No, it's, it's the, you know, we worry about colic as horse owners. We worry about it a lot. And, and I absolutely get it. Like I said, the number one thing I have with my horses is, is our, our relationship. Like that's a really big deal for me. So the, the thing is that most of the time, most of the colics are relatively mild and they're usually a gas bubble. They do it in the middle of the night all the time. We just don't see them. Where we see those horses that have done something in the middle of the night are usually the older horses. And there's a very specific type of colic they get called a, a small intestinal lipoma. Um, and that is a fatty tumor that wraps around the small intestine. And, you know, that'll do it any time of the day or night. And unfortunately, we don't find them in the middle of the night. We find them in the morning. And, and often, unfortunately, it's, it's too, too far gone. That, that happened with one of mine, actually. Um, so that's the typical scenario. But most of the time, like we're all paranoid about colic, and I get it. But most of the colics that we see are routine, run-of-the-mill, pretty boring 
we lube oil filter and move on. Love to hear it. Okay. We've talked a lot about colic. So I'm going to switch gears unless some more colic questions come in the chat, which we did definitely already, welcome them. Did you already ask Krista's questions? Oh, I haven't asked Krista's. So I'll ask one unless you have it pulled up. Do you? Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. Krista said two years ago, my seven-year-old mayor had a bad colic. She ended up at the hospital and stayed three days. It was a sand colic. She received fluids and recovered nicely. Afterwards, I put her on KER right track and give her psyllium powder for a week each month. She has been fine since then. My colic questions are, one, does cribbing contribute to colic? And two, since you practice in Florida, what percentage of the colic cases do you see are sand colic? Uh, cribbing absolutely contributes to colic, but there's a very specific type of colic that occurs with that. And it's because of the air that they pull in and a combination of things that we don't fully understand. There is a surgical colic that occurs called an epiploic foramen entrapment. And one of the many things that my off the track thoroughbred has done is have that because he's a cribber. So there we go. Um, but that is a surgical colic where they get very ill and it's not the more routine type of colic we see. So the, the colic that Krista was experiencing was probably more related to the sand. And that is a big deal in Florida. It's a big deal in a lot of places. And I have some bad news for Krista that the once a month sand clear products, which is a psyllium for a week, doesn't actually work. There is some very good work um, out of Finland, which has a similar sand scenario that we have here in Florida. We have this fine kind of beach sand everywhere, even if you're not on the beach. Um, but they did some really good work looking at management strategies. And they found that unfortunately, the one week out of the month doesn't do a thing. The good news is that plenty of roughage does a lot. So making sure that they get that full, you know, two to 2.2 .2 pounds of roughage per hundred pounds of body weight is key to helping get these horses to move the sand out. If we identify that they have it, then tubing them with the psyllium products and Epsom salts for three days in a row was the most effective way to clear it. Now let's talk about how you identify if you have it, because I don't know about you guys, but for my whole life, I have been taught that I go pick up some manure and I put it in a glove or a Ziploc bag. I add water and I hang it. And if there's sand in it, then it means my horse has sand. Unfortunately, that same paper they looked at, they x-rayed horses. And so we can shoot an x-ray of their abdomen and see if they have sand. And they found that the amount of sand in the fecal sand test had no relation to the amount of sand they had in their abdomen. So we end up looking for other symptoms that the horse has. One of the more common ones we see is diarrhea. Um, you can imagine sand coming out is a little bit abrasive and uh, leads to some diarrhea. Uh, the other thing we'll look at is just the environment that they're in. And if we have some suspicions, then we recommend an x-ray to see what we've got. So I wish there was an easy test like the fecal sand test, but it doesn't work. The other good news in that study besides that hay works was that small management changes make a big difference. And that's making sure that they're not eating really short grass. It's easy for them to pull up. Uh, this was mitigated a bit by making sure the grass was mowed taller and by using grazing muzzles to prevent that ability to get that short grass kind of up into their mouth. And then making sure that where they were fed, they weren't dropping their grain onto sandy areas. So they had some good news in terms of small management changes made big differences, but they had some bad news in that we don't have a great way to find it and we don't have a great way to treat it easily without tubing. Good news though, that at least we're not you know, relying on something that is not, a not an accurate device. We're just doing a, a an art project with poop in a bag at that point. Um, that's very helpful. And the management aspects of it are helpful too. I wouldn't have known. I mean, I wouldn't have known either of those things about the grass or, you know, feeding the grain. Sometimes we just get in our routines and we don't think enough. So, um, helpful. And Krista also said, thank you in chat. We have a question in chat that circles a bit back to nutrition for horses that are extremely easy keepers and only get a little bit of grain. Do you recommend feeding a supplement that can help provide vitamins and minerals? I recommend a couple of things. And one is obviously trying to see how we can lengthen that hay consumption through the day. So we will put slow feed hay bags in slow feed hay bags, you know, whatever we need to do to slow it down. 
So they're eating through more of the day. And then for their vitamins and minerals, we make sure that those are supplied either through a ration balancer. Um, I'm, I actually don't feed Purina, so I'm not partial to Purina, but their Omega Match ration balancer is actually really great for easy keepers. Uh, it's even lower calorie than their regular ration balancer, which is Enrich. But ration balancers are basically diet food. They contain all the vitamins, minerals, and protein that they need in a very small package. The average horse gets about a pound to a pound and a half a day. And it, so it's got no extra calories. It's literally just all the things that they need. The other option, if uh, ration balancer doesn't work for you for some reason, then I do, that's the one place, and I'm relatively anti-supplement, but it is the one place where I'll go to a vitamin mineral supplement that I have discussed with typically an equine nutritionist to find a good one that I add into that horse's diet to make up for those gaps. Yeah, it makes me think about how, like, whenever I... I don't know, ask my doctor, like, should I be taking a vitamin or whatnot? They're like, well, if you can get those minerals or like vitamins and minerals from whole foods, like do that. And if there's some reason that you can't, then like, yeah, let's go to the vitamin route, which I think is probably true for animals as well. And most of our commercial diets are a complete diet. So you don't need to worry about that. You know, the problem with us is that we make poor nutrition choices for ourselves. I always said, if you could make ration balancer for me and I just added milk, like, great course, we call that cereal, but you know, that the idea is that we're feeding them a complete diet and we don't necessarily need to fill in those gaps. If we're using most of the commercial diets out there appropriate to directions. Absolutely. So we just got a good question in chat that, uh, I think there's a, probably a lot of directions this question could take us, but what are a couple of the things I'm sure the list is long. What are a couple of the things that you wish owners knew about taking care of horses and their special needs? Oh my goodness. Um, I wish that every horse could have turnout, but I understand that that's not something that is necessarily available to all of us. If at all possible, the more time they can spend outside. Uh, I think that we see much lower health issues in any horse that has a lot of turnout. Uh, and that doesn't need to be 24 seven, but I think if you can get five to six hours a day in some way, shape or form, it goes a long way. Um, I will also try to give them enrichment in that turnout. So making sure that horses have a buddy in some way, shape or form, um, and preferably in a way where they can groom each other. That's a really big deal for horses and keeps them mentally just, ah, uh, they're in a happy place. If they've got someone who can scratch that spot, if they don't, then maybe being that, that horse for them where they have lots of grooming in their life, you know, and these are all sort of low hanging fruit. Everybody wants it to be something expensive and, and magical. And it's, it's grooming your horse and spending time with them, getting them out and having a lot of motion. Um, I think, you know, the things that we do to them certainly create some problems, but they don't always have to. So looking at how you are managing your horse and, and looking for where can I get more motion into their life and where can I get more time that they spend, with other horses to, to do a lot, um, to do a lot of kind of normal horse things, like I said, grooming. And you can even set up a barn such that horses can reach over the stalls and, and groom each other. The other thing that is my number one, in case I haven't said it yet tonight, I think at least twice, but roughage, 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 basing your diet on roughage makes you call me less. <laughs> so it is the cheapest, best, most physiologic way to feed a horse is to give him roughage. And it makes me see you less for tooth problems, for digestive problems, behavior problems, you name it. So the more that we can figure out how our horses be horses, I think those are the, the keys to managing their special needs. And how would your question, how would your answer differ for ponies? <laughs> ah, ponies. Um, for ponies, it is figuring out how you do all those things without adding food to their life. Um, you know, so they may be one where we add like a treat ball, something like that, where they have to work harder for what food they have in their life. Um, you know, is there a way where you can hang hay bags in multiple different places, even around a pasture? Um, you know, many of my ponies are unfortunately on dry lots, which is actually hard to do in Florida to get things to not grow during the summer. 
Um, but you know, figuring out how you add that same motion. I think one of the things we need to remember about ponies in particular is most of those breeds were designed to work a lot. Welsh ponies were designed to haul coal out of mines for 12 to 14 hours a day. And we don't do that with them these days. <laughs> so figuring out how you can replicate some of those long days, even low level exercise will really help you minimize the, the pounds that those ponies love to pack on. The pony pounds. I, I like that question a lot. The, when Kinsey first asked that she changed ponies to horses and then got a comment in chat that said, no, I literally meant ponies. <laughs> so I'm glad we got both answers. A question that I have for you is it sounds like colic is it's probably not fair to say it's like an overrated emergency, but I'm curious about some more underrated emergencies that just aren't in people's awareness, but that you've seen and are, are easily managed or prevented. And Kyle Carter helped. We started having this conversation with him and he was talking about how like not buckling the throat latch on a halter. If the horse swings it, its head could make the horse lose its eye. And I was like, never ever in a million years, what have I thought? I was putting my horse in danger. I've, if they're, you know, a calm horse, I thought just not a big deal. So what sort of things like that come to mind? Like the, the less heard of things that could cause a real big problem. The, the big thing for us that I think, you know, until I became a veterinarian, I didn't realize how delicate, like we all know the GI tract isn't great, but the legs are really scary. They can have very, very, very tiny wounds over a joint. And if it's in the joint, that is a life-threatening emergency. And it may be the tiniest wound you've ever seen in your life. So for me, it is being aware of the things that are in the environment that your horse can stick their leg through. And so we just did a, a fencing episode on the podcast. And one of the things that I talked about was making sure that your horses respect your fences. And for the, me, that means electric fence, because I find they respect electricity more than any other fence out there. Uh, so looking at your, your fencing, your trailer, your grooming area, you know, I walk into a cluttered barn and I see it very different. You know, I'm sure that the, the pony club masters out there see clutter, right? But I look at, oh my gosh, there's a metal stool over there. And yes, it's right up against the wall, but a horse can put their leg in there and they can lacerate something bad and we're talking about five to $7,000 to fix it if we can. So that legs for me are absolutely terrifying. And I look for every scenario where they can stick their legs and do something bad. I feel like that, that answer or that question just like gave me hives. So the, exactly what we need is more things to be afraid of, uh, which I mean, yeah, it's just the reality of life. So Keegan is asking, what is your favorite type of emergency? Favorite, favorite type of emergency to handle, ignoring the fact that it's an emergency, colic, choke, lacerations, et cetera. Well, I love chokes because 99% of the time I give them some drugs, I run a tube and off they go. They're great. It's probably 99.9% .9 of the time. I always say a choke is the scariest thing you will ever see your horse do. And they're fine. They're absolutely fine. It just doesn't look that way. They look like the exorcist, you know, like they're spewing stuff out of their mouth and their nose and they're they're usually super dramatic. They're throwing themselves on the ground. They might be busted out in a sweat. You know, they're all the things and they are absolutely fine. They can breathe. They can do everything they need to do except swallow. I come out, I give them some sedation. I run a tube. Um, I usually get covered in that feed myself, which is fine. Um, and then off they go. They're good to go. So I love call it, or I love chokes. They're my favorite. Um, lacerations are they're sort of my second favorite because they make my brain work really hard. Like I have to look at so many things in a laceration. Like we just talked about, is there a joint involved? And like, for me, that's number one. Do I have a joint involved? The next thing that I have to figure out is how the heck do I piece this puzzle together? Is it something I can suture? Am I going to need to get a bandage on here? Is it a place I can easily bandage? Probably not because it's a horse you know, what are all the things that I'm going to have to calculate into this laceration to try to get the right outcome? And then the one advantage we have with horses, even though it doesn't seem like it, is as suicidal as they are, they love to heal. Uh, so if I can get that laceration going sort of the right direction, they will heal it. It might take a lot of time, but it will heal. 
There you go. That design was done well then. <laughs> we we have part of it that we like. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that I, I used to be very hesitant to call the vet because I wanted to be just an intelligent and not annoying client. Will you walk us through some definite scenario, like definitely do call the vet right now versus you don't actually need to call me in this scenario based on some kind of common scenarios that you experience? The, the one for me is, is actually a choke. So if you've got your horse kind of spew, you've just fed them, they're spewing food out of their nose and, and it's obviously food. They're being incredibly dramatic. Like I said, it seems horrible. Wait 15 minutes. Most chokes, especially if you're feeding a pelleted diet, uh, which most of us do these days are going to clear themselves. So wait 15 to 20 minutes before you call me, even though it looks like you should be calling me and asking me when I can step into a transporter and get to you instantaneously. Um, so that's chokes, um, for colics and, and many of the other emergencies, honestly, we are very proactive about this and say like, if you are uncomfortable with what your horse is doing, then I would like to hear from you. Some scenarios where I really, really want to hear from you, again, with the vital signs, is a heart rate over what is normal for your horse. So if we're in the 50s range, I probably want to talk to you. If we're above 60, I definitely want to talk to you. If we have a temperature that's over 102.5, I really want to talk to you tonight. If your horse is quiet, their heart rate is 36, they have a temperature of 102, we can probably wait till morning. Um, if there's a laceration anywhere on a leg, I want you to call me because there may be a joint and you may not know it. My record is I had a client. I don't even know how he saw this wound. It was this big. I'm not kidding. It was the tiniest thing you've ever seen. It was on his left hind. He was a bay and it was, you know, like on the, the back of the pastern. It was in the pastern joint. So we instantaneously, you know, we put a bandage on that horse, we threw it in the trailer and off it went to the hospital and he saved his horse's life. So I tell you, I would rather have you err on the side of calling me, um, texting my, my clinic or emailing me and asking me questions as opposed to wondering, like, should I really call about this? And especially, like I said, that guideline, if that heart rate is in the fifties over 60, or that temperature is in the over 102.5 range, those are big reasons to call us. Besides the obvious, you know, like my horse is flailing on the ground. Most of us can get that. It's bleeding out. You know, we, we got that. That's a call to that. But those little tiny lacerations on a leg, I think it's surprising how often I tell people, no, no, call me and send me pictures. I need to see those. Can you clarify that a bit? Like, what do you... I mean, is it every single like mark on any of their legs you want to see a photo of, or like, what are we looking for here? If, if you have a feeling that the skin is broken, the chances are good. I want to see a photo of it. And one of the things that you can do as an owner is to look at an anatomy book and see where the joints and tendon sheaths are on a horse's leg. I'm going to tell you once you get below the fetlock, it's everywhere, which like, that's really stupid, right? Like we put this life threatening thing everywhere on the bottom of our leg, which is what we like to stick through things. So, you know, we can talk about design and behavior flaws, but if you look at an anatomy book that shows you where joints and tendon sheaths are, if there is skin, like through the skin level, like you're seeing that white under layer, then I want to call and a picture. I'm, I'm stressed right now because we're coming to the end and I'm like, there's so many things I want to learn, but actually I'm not that stressed because thank goodness you guys have done, I mean, so many episodes of your podcast now. And I'm, I think this is not news to anybody, but for anybody who hasn't listened yet, you are in for such a treat. Like I know everyone, anyone who's listening to this wants to be the best partner for their horse. And you and Justin really set people up for success in that manner. Like it's incredible. It's such a wealth of knowledge. So fortunately the information doesn't end here. Um, I guess the question that I'll go with is if you were to advise kind of all of your clients about measures that they can take kind of like safety hazards to avoid in the barn, you mentioned anything that a horse could stick its leg through 
Are there other, or in a trailer, I suppose, other things that you see too often that are an easy fix that you, you would like to bring to people's attention? I think the other thing that I see is a barn that doesn't have great airflow. Uh, in a lot of ways, that leads to a lot of issues. But the more you can keep that barn open, uh, you know, I mean, I live in Florida, obviously, so it's a little bit different. My barn is incredibly open. I can't close it if I tried. But even up north, for many of us, the ability to close a barn is more for the humans than the horses. So that ability to have really good airflow through there will also do a lot to prevent things. And once again, feeding more roughage, always. <laughs> I feel like we should have like a little ticker that <laughs> that goes off every time that gets mentioned. Uh, okay, so one question that I don't mean to take us like totally off topic here, but I just wanted to get your perspective on it because I know with you being in Florida and it being really hot right now and for most of our members, um, what are your thoughts on riding with like boots or polo wraps in the heat? I'm relatively anti- wrap of any sort. Like for example, I ship my horses without leg wraps on. And again, I'm very biased by the weather that I'm in, but they, they blow so much heat out their legs. So on a day to day basis, if I have a horse who has the ability to, to kind of keep themselves together, you know, I'm not sitting on that three or four year old that has no idea where their legs are. I tend to ride without boots on. If I'm doing more advanced skill work, um, you know, if I'm on a skill lesson, that's a level three, and I know I should be on a level one, <laughs> I'm probably going to put some level of boot on, but I more and more go to, you know, something that's vented. And the reason that I, that I say that this is where I'm going to wear boots. And I always have boots on when they're jumping, um, is that we want to protect the back of those tendons, but we can do that with relatively decent airflow. Those tendons on the back of the leg, when they are under strain, if they are even just touched by a back leg, we will shatter that tendon. And in many cases, we can't get the horse through it at all. At the very least, we have a pasture sound horse and that's it. Wow. So that's the only place on pro boot. Got it. Okay. With our last few minutes, I want to talk about the podcast a bit. So do you know how many episodes you've done to date? You probably know how many seasons, but any idea how many episodes? Um, I know we're over, I think we're at 116, 100, I'm the wrong person to ask on that, but, um, <laughs> 116 to somewhere around their episodes. <laughs> That's incredible. And I'm so glad you just reminded me of something else. You are our guest for our 100th ask an expert episode. This is it where we made it to a hundred. Um, and no better guests, like truly we're, we're learning from the best right now. Um, so you've done a hundred and change episodes for, new listeners or even existing listeners because of how many episodes that is. Do you have any favorites that you would direct them to? I have a favorite one coming out August 1st. So be ready for that one. I learned a ton in that one. Um, but I think that like our colic episodes have been to me, I've really liked them because we've talked about, you know, how to survive that, that fear that we all have. But we also have quite a few on feet and feet are a passion of mine because I think it's true, no foot, no horse, but that has a lot of nuance to it. Like the, the angles that your foot has, um, you know, having a good farrier that can put a good foot on your horse and what that looks like. We go over that quite a bit in several feet episodes. Um, we did an insurance episode recently that I learned a lot about, um, and the sarcoid episode. I really enjoyed doing the sarcoid episode because that's a weird one that us horse owners may have no idea about. Yeah. I would put myself in that category. And now I have some to queue up. I'm excited about the foot one. We, when we ask top riders, like, what do you look for in a prospect or any horse that you is going to be your ride? So often they talk about the feet and and there's a lot to know there. Like you mentioned, I'm excited for August 1st too. What I like the mystery behind that. Um, and you guys are just clearly very on top of it. I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if Kinsey and I ha know what's coming out in a couple of weeks from now. Um, that's entirely Justin. That is not me. Okay. No, that's Justin. I like he's, how much credit you hand over. Really he's, nice. he's the organization and anything production behind it. I mostly show up and have come up with a topic that we're going to cover five minutes before he sits me down. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, you 
are very good. You made our job easy tonight. You're very good at taking something and speaking so articulately about it. The last thing I want to ask in a similar vein is, will you tell us about your YouTube channel? And is that something that you're also consistently keeping up with educational videos or is it more like supplements for some of the podcast topics? Well, there's a combination of things on the YouTube channel. It's mostly educational, uh, but there's a, a series of, with a certain horse girl on it that everyone should go see. Um, horse girl kind of pokes fun at us and our, our horseyisms that we all have. Um, I find her highly entertaining. Um, but there's a lot of educational content on there from, you know, how to look at your horse's feet, how to bandage their feet, how the heck do you get eye medication in them when they don't want to have it, uh, how to get vital signs. Um, we keep up with it on a very regular basis. We also have seminars at the clinic most months. We sort of skip July and August because it's way too hot for us to do them, uh, because we do them in the barn aisle. So all of our seminars are on the YouTube channel, though, and there are a wide variety of topics on there. Most recently, we did acupuncture. So that's on there if you've got acupuncture questions. And we're super responsive to any questions. So you know, if you're on one of those and you see something and you've got a question, just drop it in there and we'll get back to you. Amazing. And that's Spring Hill Equine YouTube, not straight from the horse doctor's mouth, right? No, no. Everything is on Spring Hill Equine there. Okay, great. Um, my last question for you is... And Kinsey, maybe you'll have one too, but I just want to end my line of questioning on a fun note. Um, over the past week or so, what has been the highlight of your week? The highlight of my week was, let's see. I think I would have to say that we took, um, we took an older horse that the owners were very well-meaning but didn't quite know what they didn't know. And we have been able over the last few months, you know, I, I did a recheck on her this past week and we've been able to get her weight back where it needs to be. We're managing her eye problem that she has more appropriately. You know, we took this horse who was not looking great and doing that recheck on her this week and seeing her do really well was, was really fantastic. And her pasture mate, who is a mini, if we want to talk about pony problems, has also been struggling with laminitis, not surprising, and getting his owners on board with his management as well and getting a better trim on him and having him just do everything way better just makes makes my job worth it. That's amazing. That sounds like very heartwarming and that would make me happy too to see. Kinsey, do you have anything? Do you want to do you have anything? Do you want to just say goodbye? No, yeah, that can can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. My mic gave me an error message, so wasn't sure if, it, if this is going to be an issue. Uh, this has been so wonderful. And I, I hope that you'll come back and talk to us about another topic again soon, because I've learned a lot and I, I mean, just have really enjoyed this. So thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. I guess I should probably close with how to have a great relationship with your veterinarian, which is sort of our motto. Um, veterinarians are highly food responsive. So, you know, having food, sending food to us, you know, in any way, feeding us, but we'll be there for you in a great relationship sort of way. There's any, a good tip. <laughs> any particular food requests? Uh, no, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty universal in, in eating anything. I will say at Christmas time, um, we get a bit inundated with sweets. So if you could come up with like a, a salty package option, that would be fantastic. But we're, we're generally a pretty easy to feed crowd. We'll I anything. love that. Easy keepers. <laughs> <laughs> no roughage. Yeah. Um, we went to college for a long time. We, we survived on anything. <laughs> yeah. All right. Amazing. Well, this was such a pleasure. Thank you again for taking the time. And like Kinsey said, I hope we can have you back. I already have a lot of topic ideas. <laughs> so, um, 